Hi there. This is the first time I've ever used YouTube Studio Live. So um, if there's any glitches or things mess up, I apologize in advance. And I'm hoping that I can save this video when I'm done. Um, I'm assuming that I'll be able to. And then, um, yeah, we'll go from there. So we are talking about stress and mental health. When you bring to mind stress, when you think about mental health, how often do you think about what you eat in relation to mental health? What are some things that you instinctively think would be good for mental health when it comes to what you eat? And then what are some things that you think instinctively would be not so good for mental health or maybe even bad for mental health? Just instinctively. Take a minute and think about what you think would be good for mental health or what you've noticed in your life makes you feel good mentally when you eat it and then what things make you feel not as good mentally when you eat them. So instinctively, most of you probably thought some things like vegetables and fruits and whole foods are probably the things that you intuitively would think that are good for your mental health. Or you may have noticed in the past that when you eat those foods, you feel good. Um, and then intuitively, you probably would think junk food and processed foods and refined flours and all of those kind of things that make you feel not well physically are probably the same things that are going to make you feel not well, not well mentally. And also you've probably even experienced that in your life where you've eaten those things and realized, oh, wow, that didn't make me feel very good. So intuitively, we often know what is what is good for us, what's not good for us, what makes us feel what makes us feel um, good and what makes us feel not so good. Um, I've got some notes here in front of me, but I mixed them up a little bit. Oh, here it is. <laughs> um, yeah, so intuitively we know the foods that are made, that make us feel the best and the foods that don't make us feel the best, but most of us aren't always eating those foods. And why is it? Lots of different reasons. So most of us don't choose our foods based on, based on what's best for us or what's going to give us the most building blocks or the best fuel. Most of us choose what we're going to eat based on convenience and, um, how we're feeling. So if we're tired or if we're busy or um, if we're in a social gathering or some of us make choices based on what we can afford, what's on sale, that sort of thing. Um, I'm just going to turn off my Facebook because I hear some beeping and that's annoying. Um, <clears throat> so, so yeah, that's, that's the reason most of us make the choices on what we eat. It's not, there are some people that are making the choices based on what's going to give them the best fuel and what's going to make them feel the best. But for the most part, we're making choices based on many different things other than um, what's going to really nourish us the most. So this may seem like an odd connection to you, um, talking about mental health and food. Maybe you've never really made any connections between how you feel mentally and the foods you eat. And maybe you're thinking, well... The mental health issues that I have or the mental health issues that family members of mine have are neurotransmitter deficiencies and, you know, it's um, more complicated. It's more of a complex issue than just simply what they eat. Um, if you're thinking that, that's okay because that's that's what most of us have been been told and been, been taught So um, and told by our doctors. We... We don't often hear in the media much talk about what is good for us uh, or what is, we're not, we're not really told what's best for us mentally 
um, in regards to what we should be eating. We often hear about, you know, self-care, um, going on vacation, exercising, getting fresh air, taking time for yourself. All of those kind of things are talked about a lot when it comes to mental health. But when it comes to discussing mental health and diet, you really hear very, very little. So I want to help you today make a few connections between diet and how you're feeling mentally. So we've all heard of and maybe even know someone in our life that struggles with ADD or ADHD. Um, ADHD is defined as the inability to regulate attention. So people with ADHD have trouble directing attention to what's most important. So sustaining that attention for long enough to complete a task um, and for especially in a in a you know a short amount of time or in a or in a set amount or required amount of time. This can cause obviously problems in work and school and relationships and um, in communication and getting meeting deadlines, that sort of thing. But the major majority of people who have attention problems do not actually have ADHD. There's a lot of people who have problems with attention and with focus but don't actually have ADHD. Nearly every psychiatric diagnosis that we know of, depression, anxiety, bipolar disorder, schizophrenia, substance abuse, PTSD, just to name a few, can affect our ability to concentrate. Even common issues like stress or lack of sleep can impair our attention and our focus. So whether you're interested in improving concentration and focus for treating symptoms of ADHD or other health challenges, mental health challenges that you have, it's important to understand how diet affects our ability to regulate our attention. And to, to look at that, I want to um, shed some light on the, um, what we'll call the chemistry of concentration. So psychiatrists and other doctors are, and authors and people in the media were often fond of saying that ADHD is caused by a chemical imbalance in the brain and that there are lots of medicines that we have that can correct this imbalance. And I'm not here to argue that at all. There are at least two brain chemicals um, or, neuro, or neurotransmitters <clears throat> that seem to be involved in specifically in ADHD, and that's dopamine and norepinephrine. These are you can think of these as tiny messengers within the brain that sig send signals from one brain cell to the other. And if level levels of dopamine or norepinephrine are too low, or if the system that processes these neurotransmitters are not functioning properly, there's usually a stimulant medication given, like Ritalin or Adderall, which by forcing the brain cells to release higher amounts of these chemicals, enable them to be able to communicate. But what causes, I want you to think about this, what causes these chemicals to become out of balance or imbalanced in the first place? Why are the levels of these chemicals too low? And where do these chemicals come from? I should have got myself a glass of water because I'm thirsty all of a sudden from talking. But anyways, I'll be all right. We're not going to be on here that much longer. Brain chemicals come from food. Where else could they possibly come from? They may, that may seem obvious to some people who have, um, you know, dove deep into this stuff. But for most people, that's not a common, a common thought. It's not co a common thought or a, an obvious thought that that's where our neurotransmitters come from. Many people, not even, including doctors, don't even think about that connection. Doctors are trained to think about which medications might correct the imbalance, but not what causes it in the first place. And probably if you asked your doctor what caused your imbalance in the first place, they would say um, maybe it's hereditary, maybe there's for some reason you have a deficiency, but they have no idea why. Um, but we're going to discuss which foods help your body to make these important chemicals. So dopamine and norepinephrine are made from protein. The body breaks down proteins from foods like fish, chicken, beef, eggs, in cheese, dairy, um, into amino acids. So this is like the smallest building, building blocks of protein. And one of these amino acids is 
tyrosine. The body then uses special chemicals, um, special chemical reactions to turn tyrosine into dopamine and norepinephrine, um, the brain cells that we need, the brain cells that we need to communicate with one another. So in order to get enough neurotransmitters, you need to get enough tyrosine. In order to get enough tyrosine, you need to get enough amino acids. In order to get enough amino acids, you need to get enough protein and be able to digest, absorb, and assimilate that. So does that sound like a lot to handle? I'm going to try to break it down a little more, um, a little more clearly for you. So first of all, you need to we need to get enough protein in order to get enough amino acids that can be broken down into those building blocks. But then there's a couple of other steps that even though you may be eating enough protein or you think you're eating enough protein, if your digestive system isn't working optimally and breaking down those proteins to the degree and the level that they need to be broken down, then your body can't utilize and absorb what it needs. So that's why making sure that your digestive system is optimized um, I'm not going to get into optimizing your digestion in this video, but I will talk specifically and in-depthly about digestion in, in the next video. Um, making sure that you get enough protein, protein is foundational to having a healthy brain. So in particular, making sure you get some protein at your first meal of the day is going to be extra helpful. And we'll get into a little bit more of why that is in the next couple of segments. So the brain is mostly made of fat. About two-thirds of your brain is made of fat, and about 20% of that fat should consist of omega-3 fatty acids. Omega-3 fatty acids keep our cell, main, cell membranes flexible and healthy. Without these special polyunsaturated fats, brain cells become stiff and can't communicate with each other easily. So even if there is plenty of dopamine and norepinephrine around, brain cells may not be able to pass these chemicals back and forth properly if the right fats aren't built into their membranes. So if your brain is built with cheap vegetable oil like canola oil and sunflower oil and trans fats and margarine, your brain, mem your cell membranes are going to be stiff and unhealthy and not functioning properly. So even if you've got all of those proteins available, they're not going to be utilizable. The brain is super picky about omega-3s. They're the favorite fat of the brain is omega-3. Um, the favorite favorite omega fat of the brain is DHA. There are three types of omega-3 fatty acids, ALA, DHA, EPA. You've probably heard of all of those. Um, a lot of people take fish oils these days, and, you, and you'll usually read on the label what percentage of all of those is in your fish oil. ALA, <clears throat> ALA is found in both plant and animal foods. Popular vegetarian sources of ALA include flaxseed, walnuts, and chia seeds. ALA, <clears throat> ALA is often called the parent omega-3 because of its pathway. ALA turns to EPA and to DHA. <clears throat> From looking at this pathway, you might think that if you eat enough ALA, you're all set. But there's a bit of a problem. The body has a very hard time converting ALA to EPA and DHA. So about 95% of it remains stuck in the form of ALA. However, if you convert, if we convert EPA to DHA very easily, however, we can convert EPA to DHA very easily. So this means that in order to be sure our brain gets enough DHA, we need to eat EPA and DHA themselves. Plant foods do not contain EPA or DHA. EPA and DHA are hard to find in the typical American diet because the best sources are wild animal foods, cold water fish, fatty fish like salmon and mackerel, naturally raised animals that are raised on pasture and um, not grain-fed animals, grass-fed cows, pasture-raised chickens and pork, um, wild meat. This is why public health officials sometimes recommend omega-3 supplements because a lot of people aren't getting enough of these omega-3 rich foods, specifically these EPA or DHA rich foods. Um, and if you're a vegetarian or a vegan, you're going to have a really hard time creating enough of, of these specific fats to make your membranes as healthy as possible. These supplements are typically in the form of fish oil, but there are also vegan-friendly suppl supplements available, which are made from algae. Um, so you, if you're taking 
a supplement, um, an algae supplement, you may be getting enough as long as your body is really doing well at that conversion. Um, it's a bit of a crapshoot, in my opinion. So to consider what else are mortal enemies of our mental health, just to give you um, a quick rundown of a few other things to consider besides the proteins and the fats, mortal enemies of mental health that I will dig deeper into each of these in other videos. But so you know, gluten, anything you're sensitive to, anything that you do not, do not digest well, sugar, heavy metals, sedentary lifestyle, exercise, uh, lack of exercise. Exercise is called, sometimes called our most underused antidepressant. Vegetarian and veganism, because beans, legumes, um, nuts, seeds, those things are high in lectins, high in, uh, they help, they can sometimes contribute to B vitamin deficiency. Animal fats and proteins are what our body really needs as the building blocks for our brain and our cells. Low fat diets, because we're not getting enough of those fats that we need. Um, excessive stimulants. Stress management is not a luxury, it's a necessity because our, our brains and our bodies just can't deal with so much of this, um, of this chronic and constant stress. Poor and insufficient sleep are, are uh, mortal enemies of our mental health. Electromagnetic fields from our Wi-Fi routers, from our cell phones, that constant bombardment with, with those magnetic fields have been shown to be really problematic for a lot of people's brains. Alcohol is toxic. It is toxic to our brains, and our brains are super sensitive to alcohol. Um, when we think of alcoholics, we often think of liver failure, but if you've ever known any alcoholics, you have seen the brain damage that happens from alcohol, I'm certain. Alcohol depletes vitamins, minerals, antioxidants. And um, for women, more than three drinks in one sitting and more than eight drinks per week is considered heavy drinking, linked to cancer, hormone issues, heart disease, and all sorts of mental health problems. Um, and for men, it's a little bit higher than that, but, but that just gives you an idea. And to give you a few tips for treating ADHD, and other mental health issues with diet, be sure to eat protein at breakfast. Include foods rich in omega-3 omega fatty acids in your diet, ideally from healthy animal source um, foods because they have more of the EPA and DHA that we really need um, to, to, make us, to make our brains as healthy and robust as possible. And if you're not getting enough of those foods in or you're concerned about your mental health, take a daily supplement containing at least 300 milligrams of EPA. Reduce omega-6 intake by minimizing vegetable oils, nuts, and seeds. So omega-6 and omega-3 work in a ratio together. And most of us are very, very high on the omega-6 spectrum and very low in the omega-3 spectrum. So lowering your omega-6 intake can help to can help those omega-3 fats work better. Um, improve mineral absorption in your body by reducing phytic acid intake. Um, minimize by this you can do this by minimizing grains, beans, nuts, seeds. If you have iron deficiency, increase meat intake and reduce phytic acid intake beans, grains, nuts, seeds, and you may even want to consider taking an iron supplement. So um, there's a few other things. Improve zinc status by reducing phytoacid intake. Same things, beans, grains, nuts, seeds, um, and include animal foods in your diet. That's where you're going to get the most usable, utilizable, absorbable, digestible forms of protein. Zinc supplements may be helpful. Iron supplements may be helpful. Um, but make sure that you check and see if you're deficient. So go and get some blood work done. Get a good panel, a good full workup done so you can see where your existing levels are sitting. Um, if you're a vegan or vegetarian, please look for supplements to help you out. Um, an algae supplement that has uh, omega-3 fats in it. Um, work, work on improving your digestion so that you're absorbing as much as possible from the foods you're eating. So 
taking out the triggers, so taking out anything that you're reacting to. You don't know if you're reacting to something until you remove it temporarily and then add it back in. This includes caffeine and alcohol. So if you think that you're sensitive to some foods, that is causing your body to not be able to absorb and utilize the other foods and the vitamins, minerals, proteins, fats that are in those foods, the building blocks that you need. Um, dial in your diet. So make sure you're eating enough, especially of those foods that we've discussed uh, so far today. Have healthy snacks ready to cook, eat, carry healthy snack, snack options so that you're not caught in starvation mode and reaching for chips or chocolate bars at the gas station. Um, eat more fat, animal fats, healthy fats, get rid of the vegetable oils, canola oil, for any kind of refined or processed oils. Eat at least three hours before bedtime. This will help your digestion, help to improve your digestion um, rather than eating right before bed and not giving your body time to do that uh, digestion before you go to bed and do the repair, cleanup, and healing while you're sleeping. Instead, your body's busy digesting. So there's there's um, all kinds that I could talk about on that, but we're going to talk more about that in the digestion video coming up. And supplements. The foundation, bare, bare minimum supplements that I suggest for mental health, B-complex, that's your stress vitamins, which are eaten up when you're under a considerable amount of stress, which most of us are this day and age. Magnesium, that's going to help your nervous system to calm down, relax, look for the bisglycinate or glycinate form to be uh, most effective for this. Omega-3s, cod liver oil. And a vitamin mineral supplement, um, in particular an antioxidant, A, C, E, zinc, and selenium. Um, so that's the bare minimum that I recommend. And be consistent with these things, all of these things. They're, you're not necessarily going to see results overnight, but you will see results if you're consistent. Um, so I know there was a lot of information in this video. I this is normally an hour presentation that I do that I try to just like boil down really quickly into like a 15 minute video. And I'm already over at to over 20 minutes now. So um, I'm still gonna post this video. It's live anyways, but I'm gonna hopefully post it to my YouTube channel. Um, but then I'm gonna do my best to start breaking some of this down a little bit more better, a little bit more better, a little bit more um, into usable, digestible chunks for you because once I got talking I realized there was just way too much that I was um, trying to compact into this one short video so thanks for tuning in um, please comment with any questions that you have below this video and I will be sure to answer them but I will also it will also help to guide me when making follow-up videos to this video what I can dive deeper into and what I can give you more clarity on. So thank you again for tuning in and see you soon